So if you brought your Bibles, let's go ahead and open up to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 20. One more time. Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. This morning's sermon is titled, Speak to the Rock. Speak to the Rock. God's desired plan for how we seek provision from him. Speak to the Rock. Beginning at verse 1, let's read. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod. You and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water from the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hollow me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, the water of contention. Because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hollowed among them. He was sanctified among them. This morning, as we examine this text, we're going to be examining the second account in which Moses strikes the rock and God miraculously provides water for his people under life-threatening conditions. The last time me and my family were here, we had the privilege uh, to share the word of God where we preached the first account. Uh, back in Exodus chapter 17, where Moses struck the rock and God provided water. And it was an awesome display of God's might and power, but it also communicated a spiritual truth. One thing that I mentioned was anytime God does a miracle, he is very specific about his instructions to do it because it communicates truth about him. And in the first account, we saw that it pointed to the gospel message as the rod, uh, the, symbolizing the power and authority of God the Father striking the rock, striking the sun, striking Christ to open the way for living water, spiritual water to satisfy the spiritual thirst of your heart that God created you for, the Holy Spirit inside of you, the very thing that uh, as God created you to have his spirit dwell in your spirit, that you can have a real relationship with him. And the people drank the water. Now, in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this second account, <clears throat> in this second account, it is one of much more sadness and sorrow as we see the people of Israel grappling with facing their consequences of being in the wilderness for 40 years, as well as Moses failing before the people, sinning in disobedience to God, and him having to have God's pronouncement of judgment upon him and Aaron that they would not get to lead the people into the promised land. But yet, despite Moses' failure 
and the position that God gave him. God still shows himself faithful in this text to glorify his own name, to still hollow his own name, to be able to provide water for the people in the great desperation that they had. God will always still be faithful to accomplishing his will for all eternity, despite what any man does wrong or fails to do in a position of leadership. For any of you who are note takers out there this morning, there are three main points that I want us to be able to see as we unpack this text, as we work through it. Point number one, facing consequences, we must accept responsibility. Facing consequences, we must accept responsibility. Point number two, following commands. Obedience matters. Obedience matters to God. And point number three, fighting carnality. We must crucify the flesh and forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. And the main point, the main truth, I would call those sub-points, but it's, it's God's desire for us to see the truth and how he desires us to approach him for his provision as he gives us the command to speak to the rock. And I pray that we can see that as we get into the text this morning. Now, for anyone who is unfamiliar with the context of the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers is titled the book of Numbers because it is, in fact, a book of Numbers. We start off seeing in the very beginning a census that is done of military age men, ages 20 and up, who would be ready to go to war as they entered into the promised land. And they formed themselves and were getting ready for what God had for them. But yet there is a failure along the way that occurs. Uh, you see, much has transpired since the last time Moses struck the rock inside of Exodus. In Exodus, this was uh, very, the, they were brand new believers, if you will. It was within the first year. God had just delivered them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, and God was teaching them to trust and obey him for all of their needs along the way, and God miraculously did so. But yet, along the way, as God gave them the law, the Ten Commandments of Mount Sinai, and go through the book of Leviticus and all the specific instructions of how they are to form themselves as a society, we come into the book of Numbers where now they are beginning militarily ready to enter into the promised land. But then we come to Exodus chapter 13, where they came to a place called Kadesh, the same as we see here in chapter 20 where they were getting ready to go into the promised land just a year after being outside of Egypt. And God gives Moses specific instructions to send spies into the land, to go check out the land, go see the promised land. And so they did so. They sent 12 men, including Joshua and Caleb and that 12. And they came back with a great report that inside of the land, it truly was a land flowing with milk and honey. It said they had on all sorts of fruit of pomegranates and figs and clusters of grapes that were so big that they had to have two men carry on poles back down. But as they are giving this report, they also reported that inside of the land there was fortified enemies. There was giants in the land, and they were terrified at the sight of what they saw. They were afraid that they could not be able to. And so they started to give a negative report that we should not enter into the promised land. In fact, we should turn back now while we can and go back to Egypt because it will be a death sentence if we go up. God was displeased in this. God was displeased in it because it was complaining. God had saw all of the mighty things that he had already done for them with, with destroying Egypt, all of the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, all of the provision along the way. God is saying, if I can do all these things, what makes you think I cannot take you into the promised land and destroy these giants and tear down these fortified strongholds? And he could. Joshua and Caleb believed God. They tried to get the people to turn to the right way, but they refused. They hardened their hearts, and they complained. They complained against God. God was furious, 
God was so furious in Numbers chapter 14. We see that God said that he was going to consume them all and kill them all and leave Moses and start the whole process over. Moses prayed. Moses intervened. Moses called out to God for him not to have his wrath poured out on his people in the wilderness. And God answered Moses' prayer. God showed grace. God showed loving kindness. But yet he gave a specific judgment against this generation that was full of disbelief, that was full of complaining. He judged them that they would not get to enter into the promised land, but that they would stay. They were sentenced to stay in this wilderness until they all passed away and the next generation would get to enter into the promised land. The book of Numbers is multiple generations. It spans the the length of the 40 years that they were inside of the wilderness and even longer with some of the events that had to come after And that is where we find ourselves here in chapter 20. We are finding ourselves in the 40th year of their time in the wilderness. It is much different than the first account where they were brand new in the wilderness. Now they have been here for 40 years. Let's go ahead and get into our text, looking at verses 1 and 2. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And so we come to this place where it says that they are back at Kadesh. Kadesh is the same exact place where they left off whenever they were too fearful to enter the promised land. Kadesh is also called Kadesh Barnea in multiple instances inside of the scriptures. It is known for having springs and wells that were there. It was uh, no wonder that the Israelites, as they were inside of the wilderness, that they would come back to Kadesh to be able to survive as there was water there for them to drink. But I want us to note as well that it says that Miriam died there. This is showing us the transition between the generations, that the first generation that failed to go into the promised land is starting to pass away as God had given his judgment that they would not get to, that they would die in the wilderness. And we know that it is the 40th year because later inside of this chapter, it, it explains the death of Aaron. And in Numbers 33, it tells us that it was in the 40th year that Moses' brother Aaron died as well as Moses' sister Miriam to die here. Forty years back at the same place where they failed before. God had brought them full circle. The name Kadesh literally means holy. It means holy. This was the place in which God was going to make the generation holy for his service. He was going to teach them and prepare them to be dependent on him, to obey him as they go into the promised land. And so there's much work that the Lord is doing for them here, but they find themselves to where all their resources and water is running out, and now they are back inside of a life threatening circumstance, very much like inside of Exodus 17. We are talking millions of people out here with livestock who are dependent on water. We cannot live without water more than three days before we die. They are here. It is bad. And it's the same situation. How are they going to respond after 40 years of being in the wilderness. Let's go to verses 3 through 5. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. Now these three verses bring us to our first sub point that we must face consequences and accept responsibility. 
The Israelites, the reason why they did not enter the promised land was because of their own disbelief, their own sin, their own complaining before the Lord. The reason why they were in this situation is because of themselves, but yet they did not want to accept responsibility. They wanted to contend with Moses. They wanted to blame him. It's your fault, Moses, that we are here. It is your fault, God, that we are here. And this is not something new that man has done. It goes all the way back to the garden when Adam sinned and God asked Adam, why did you do this? And he said, it is the woman whom you gave me. Let me blame someone else but myself and then try to cover it up with fig leaves. It does not work. Let us look at some of the complaints that they are giving in this process at verse 3. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of things that transpired in 40 years. There are many events where these Israelites continued to complain against God. And it provoked God to wrath to the point where he consumed them in many different ways. Whether it was a plague or whether it was uh, the ground opening up and swallowing the people. To even fire coming down on them and consuming them by the thousands because of complaining. Complaining, <coughs> excuse me. I will not complain that my throat wants to be dry right now. Instead, I will thank God that he has given me water that I can be able to drink. Complaining inside of First Corinthians is put on the equal level of sexual immorality and the reasons of the sins for destroying the people. Complaining says to God that whatever you have already done and provided is not good enough for me. I am not going to trust that. Instead, I'm going to focus on whatever I think things need to be. I'm not concerned about the will of God and what he is trying to accomplish in the provision that he has already given to me. They complained. They said that they would have rather been dead with those who have been consumed than be still alive. They were still alive. Alan just shared with us about the body's resilience to want to stay alive. They were saying they would rather be dead with those who were judged and consumed. I would not want to be in that place. This is a false lie that they were believing in their heads. Verse 4, why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we and our animals should die here? So we are seeing their concern not only for themselves, but for their animals. This was their livelihood. It was their jobs, if you will, as shepherds in the wilderness to be able to take care of their families. They were seeing the things, the little things that they did have in the wilderness were in jeopardy. And they wanted to blame Moses. It is your fault, Moses, that you took us out of Egypt as if we did not have a willing choice to follow as if we were not guilty of our sin before the Lord that we were here now for 40 years verse 5 and why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place it is not a place of grains or figs or vines or pomegranates nor is there any water to drink Moses this is not the promised land that you promised us this is an evil place how dare we call what God has called holy, an evil place. This was God's judgment for them to be here and face this as Kadesh is a place of being made holy. As they were in Kadesh to be prepared to go into the promised land, it is not evil. It was God's will still for them to deal with these things. They had to face the consequence that they were not going to get to enjoy the blessings and the fruit of the promised land. This does not mean that they cannot have their hearts right before the Lord and enjoy eternity with him. In fact, the reality that they are still alive is God's mercy that they can be right with the Lord. But instead, they are complaining here. They need to face their consequences and accept responsibility you see for us to come to the Lord 
For us to be made right with God, we have to accept responsibility for our own sin. The Bible tells us in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We are all guilty and under a death sentence unless God intervenes. And he has done so by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sin on the cross. That if we are willing to repent and believe in him, we can be saved. But we must repent. We must come to behold and see the how horrible and wicked sin is and the own sinfulness that has existed in our lives and repent of it and give it to God. We must accept responsibility if we are ever going to enter the promised land or be with God for all eternity. Let us see what happens next. Let's go to verse 6. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. So they see themselves in this dangerous situation where the people again coming towards Moses, contending with him with a mob-like mentality over the life-threatening circumstances in which they are facing. And Moses and Aaron's response is to get away from the people and go to the tabernacle of meeting where they will fall on their faces and the Lord appeared to them. In Exodus chapter 33, it tells us that with the tabernacle of meeting, that it was a place in which when someone wanted to seek God, that they would go to the tabernacle of meeting and they would wait for Moses and Moses would come out to the tabernacle of meeting. And it says that the pillar of cloud that followed them by day would descend down to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. This is the glory of the Lord appearing as it is describing right here. And it tells us in Exodus Exodus 33 that when this would happen that Moses would speak to God face to face as a friend speaks with their friend face to face. What a privilege Moses had to speak with God in his glory and God opens the same way for us to be able to talk to him today through his Holy Spirit and through his word. Moses and Aaron humbled themselves and fell before the Lord, and the Lord came to them. And the Lord, in verse 7, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses. And so he gives him something very clear he is going to say, and Moses better pay attention. Verse 8, verse 8 and 9, let's read them both. Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded. Which brings us to our second sub-point today, following commands. Obedience matters. It matters. The way we obey the Lord matters. It is our witness to the world. As we described in Sunday school or in uh, Coffee with Jesus, how it is a horrendous heresy to describe a sinning Christianity where we are just continuing stiff-necked. That is not God's will. That is not shining the light. We are to be faithful in our relationship with him and listen to him and hear him. And Moses getting to hear the word of God and giving him specific instruction. Before we move on into seeing how Moses actually responded in disobedience, I want us to just look at what God is telling Moses to do. Because remember, when God is about to perform a miracle, the details matter in what he is trying to communicate about himself. And if the first instance of Moses striking the rock was to communicate the gospel message of God the Father striking the Son in order to open the way for the living waters, the Holy Spirit to come into our lives to give us life. We need to see what this message is going to communicate. And so he tells Moses, he says, take the rod. You and your brother Aaron gather the congregation, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water, and everyone will be able to drink. And so this this instance 
right here. We, we need to just stop and, and look at a few other details because he says, take the rod. There's been much that has happened with that rod. As we described, many miracles have occurred as we see that it represents God's authority and power in the plagues and in all the miracles that have occurred in the wilderness through this. But something even more interesting has occurred with this rod going back to Numbers chapter 17. In Numbers 16, there was what occurred called the rebellion of Korah to where there were about 250 men up trying to usurp the authority that God had given to Moses saying we are just as holy as Moses and we will lead the people we don't need Moses and God consumed them the ground opened up and ate them all 250 of them and then the people of God complained they said Moses this is your fault you killed these people no it was their own sin and hardness of heart trying to get in the place of what God had established that killed them but yet the people blamed Moses and the Bible tells us in Numbers 16 that God was furious at this that God grew angry and consumed consumed 14,000 of the Israelites who were complaining at once with fire. They were destroyed. And then in Numbers 17, God does another miracle with the rod, this time with Aaron's rod. And please keep in mind that Aaron's rod and Moses' rod, while two different rods that both of them used, Moses had his, Aaron had his, God still did miracles through both to communicate the same message. And inside in number 17, God tells these other Levites to put their rods out in front of the tent of meeting and Aaron put his rod down and let's see what happens. Let's see who is holy. And as they woke up the next day, it said that Aaron's rod budded and sprouted blossoms and almonds. It bore fruit. And it's very important as we get into this picture because as Moses is going to take the rod, he is taking this rod that had already bore fruit. But after it bore fruit, God specifically tells Moses, he says, now Moses, take this rod that bore fruit that has the blossoms and almonds on it, and I want you to put it into the Ark of the Testimony, put it into the Ark of the Covenant, and it will be a testimony to you to put away your complaints, for the people to put it away, to look at God's provision that came through this rod as a reminder that I am a faithful God. I am the one who will provide for you. I will give you what you need. Keep it as a testimony. And so now they find themselves in a circumstance where the people are complaining again. And so God is telling Moses, take the rod. And in verse 9, it says that he took the rod from before the Lord, indicating that he had to go back into the, 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 uh, the, the, the ark to be able to take that rod with him that had bore fruit. Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation. Now speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. God's desire to communicate for us to know the truth and how to seek his provision is one in which where we speak to the rock. You see, Christ has already been crucified. The way has already been opened up. Now we get to be in a relationship with God. We get to have his Holy Spirit inside of us to where now if we need something, we call on him. He hears us. We are his children. That is his desire. That is the message that he wants Moses to communicate to the people for them to see his, take the rod with you. Hold that rod up. Let them be reminded of the provision of everything that I have done for you so that way you can now just speak to the rock God give us water we know you've provided and God was faithful in providing the water that is God's way he desires us to come to him is through a relationship after we have come to repentance and faith in Christ to speak to the rock I pray we do not miss that, and I pray that whatever is going on inside of our lives, that we would call on 
Him, that we would speak to Him just as Moses spoke to God face to face as a friend speaks to a friend, calling on our Lord. And so let's see what Moses does. So God gives Moses specific instruction. Let's move to verse 10. Let's read 10 through 12. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hollow me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. So Moses has these specific instructions that communicate a great message of how we are to come to the Lord and call on Him in our relationship with Him in our desperatest needs and all of our needs. But yet Moses and Aaron, it says they gathered the people together and then began to give a message. Moses said, hear now you rebels. Must we, must we in, in our own human strength bring water for you out of this rock this brings us to our third sub point fighting carnality we must crucify the flesh you see this this these words that are coming out of moses mouth and the way that he is addressing the people gives us insight into the heart and mind of moses and what he had been dealing with for these 40 years going all the way back to the first time that they struck the rock and the people contended with him and were complaining with him and they called the place Massa and Meribah being contention and temptation all of these events that took place that Moses should have already been in the wilderness with the people almost 40 years ago, but it was because of their disbelief. It was because of their sin. It was because of their complaining. It was because of their rebellion that Moses was now back in the same circumstance 40 years later, coming, having to come to this rock again because of the people. And so he blamed them. He let them know very clearly, this is because of you. Moses was growing bitter in his heart to the people. He blamed them. It was someone else's sin and their consequence that was now bleeding into your life. And it's offensive. And it matters how we deal with this in the Lord. Because offense will come. Our Lord said, he says, tribulation will come. People will sin and there will be consequences that we have to deal with. But how do we deal with them? Moses was letting it out on them. Now, I'm not going to judge Moses beyond what the scripture says because I have not been in Moses' circumstance. I have not been in these life-threatening circumstances or 40 years in the wilderness. Numbers chapter 12, in fact, tells us that Moses was the most humble man in the world. Now, that's kind of odd when you think about it, whenever he is the one pinning it, saying that he is the most humble man man in the world but it is God who gave him the word it is inspired by them and I reason and I really believe the reason why Moses was the most humble man was because of the encounters that he had with God the such high view of God that he had spending 40 days on top of Mount Sinai receiving the law coming down with his face glowing or being put into the cleft of the rock asking God to see the tail end of his glory he saw God he knew all these things that God had done to where he felt so little. He could be the humblest man on the planet because he saw God for how big he was. But yet he, being a human, is still susceptible to temptation. And he was offended by the people and their rebellion. But yet the way that it came out it was in so much pride in the way that he said, must we, must we bring water out for you out of this rock? 
Moses, this is not a work that you and Aaron do. This is a work that only God can do, a thing that only God can provide. And we see what Moses does in verse 11. And before we, we look at what he does, you know, back to our point of fighting carnality to crucify the flesh, our Lord tells us inside of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, he says that if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be a Christian, you must pick up your own cross and deny yourself daily. That includes offenses when they come. Our Lord tells us inside of his Sermon on the Mount that, that how can you be forgiven if you are unwilling to forgive yourself? We must be willing to forgive others. We must be willing to turn our cheek to offense. But yet, if offense comes from your brother or sister in such a way that you feel you cannot forgive them, the Bible then calls you to action to go to your brother and sister. And if they will not listen, then go to two or three. And if they still will not listen, then go to the elders. And if they still will not listen, then go before the church. But if you can, instantly forgive. If you can, let it go. Turn the cheek. Do so. Do not be like Moses to where now you are taking the things of God and trying to beat people over the head with it, which we will see here momentarily. Verse 11, let us read what takes place. Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Moses disobeyed. He did not hold up the rod showing the fruit and provision of God and speak to the rock for the water to flow through to show the relationship that God desires us to have. Instead, he took the rod that had precious fruit on it and he beat the rock twice with it, most likely damaging the fruit that had been on that rod. Christ is not crucified twice he is not. We heard Lisa reading from the scripture from Hebrew about putting Christ, crucifying him afresh, crucifying him anew. That is not the way. We do not stiff neck our, ourself to God. We do not push ourselves beyond the grace that has been provided. We engage in the relationship. Moses was now in his flesh taking the things of God to release his frustration upon the people in disobedience. For anyone who is a preacher, for anyone who is a Christian, who is trying to witness to others, and you come across people that maybe you are close to and you feel frustrated by the choices that they are making, and you so desperately want them to know, do not go to them in a way that you are going to beat them with the Bible to hope they understand. That will not work. It is God's goodness that leads men to repentance. We must be the light. We must be Christ to them. We must have the fruit of the Spirit, being patient with one another, gentle, not as Moses was, reckless with the things of God, and communicating a horrendous message of crucifying the rock twice. That was not God's will for what Moses was to communicate. But yet, despite Moses' disobedience, we see God still provided. God still showed himself faithful. Verse 12, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, because you did not trust me, you had disbelief to hollow me, to make me set holy, to sanctify me in the eyes of the people with the things that you are going to communicate. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. God pronounces his judgment on Moses and Aaron that they would not get to bring the people into the promised land. If it wasn't clear before with the judgment that was made on the people, it is clear now that they will not get to go. There's opportunity for Moses and Aaron to repent in this. There is. 
I don't believe Moses is damned to hell because of what he did. In fact, I believe he did repent, especially whenever he went up to the mountain to pass away. It, it hurt. I could imagine him being able to see the promised land so clearly, but not yet be able to go. Spending 80 plus years of his life inside of the wilderness to go, and he did not. Verse 13, this was the water of Meribah, the water of contention, the fighting, the complaining of the people. But God, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, not just with Moses, but with the Lord in their complaints and in their needs, they complained against God. And he was hollowed among them. He was sanctified by himself because God is holy, God is faithful, God cannot and will not deny himself and what he has set out to accomplish for all eternity. But that's the beautiful thing about this passage is that we have a God who loves us so much that he desires us to know the way. He desires us to, as, as we learned in Coffee of Jesus, to make it simple. Speak to the rock. Jesus has already paid the price on the cross for our sin. We just must repent and believe. We must trust, turn to him and trust him in anything we need. He says, call on me, speak to the rock, engage in your relationship with him. I am faithful to you. You be faithful to me. And so today, if there is any provision that you need in your life, call on God. He invites you to speak to the rock. He calls you to look to his provision, to look to the rod that sprouted all of the fruit. Look at the way Jesus has saved your life. Look at the things he's already accomplished in your life. Think upon these good things. To close out, if you will, let's go ahead and turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 through 18. These are very short verses. I want to leave you with these. This is the will of God for your life. This is the way that we are to approach God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. It says, Rejoice always. Pray always without ceasing in everything give thanks and if it's not clear it says for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you rejoice always always no matter what circumstance whatever you find yourself in you can find your joy in the Lord it is a verb to rejoice let us go back let's look at the provision that God has already done let us rejoice in him and our relationship with him always pray without ceasing speak to the rock continue your relationship abide with him daily and in everything in everything, no matter the circumstance, give thanks. Let us praise him that the water still flowed out of the rock despite the disobedience of Moses, despite the disobedience of men who have come before, who have hurt the name of God, but yet he will still provide. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you're ever questioning what is God's will for your life? Come back to the most fundamental basic. It is right here. He tells you this is the will. If you don't have this in your life, forget about where you need to go or what you need to do. You need to rejoice, pray without ceasing, and give thanks. Let us go ahead and open for our invitational hymn.